this edition of Southern Newsweek, a local political expert considers Helen Clark's chances of becoming the next UN Secretary General. Research reveals the dangers secondary school pupils face during sports days and it's prompting calls for change. And a Green Party MP tours our university in a bid to get students interested in politics. Kia ora, I'm Holly Buchanan. Former Prime Minister Helen Clark has the government's backing in her bid to head the United Nations. She's in the running to be the eighth Secretary General replacing Ban Ki-moon, and a local political expert thinks she could be the pick of the bunch. One of New Zealand's greatest political exports. Former Prime Minister Helen Clark is applying to head the United Nations. She'd be the first female and first Kiwi to do so. I think it's a really positive development. I think Helen Clark's been biding her time. I think she's clearly had the job in, in mind for a while. And I think she's very well placed to get it. Clark was a New Zealand Prime Minister for nine years and the UN's Development Programs Administrator for seven. She's still in that role and is one of eight leaders vying to replace Ban Ki-moon when his term's over at the end of the year. Clark has the backing of current Prime Minister John Key and the wider New Zealand government who have written to the UN Secretary Council in support. All the signs are that the Prime Minister will do his utmost to forget about past political differences and look at this as a, a great appointment, a potentially great appointment for New Zealand, and it would be. It's a very high profile role. Patman says Clark's appointment would boost New Zealand's profile internationally. He says New Zealand has a strong history of placing people in high level positions around the globe, and this is another example. I think Helen Clark's bid has a real prospect of success because A, we're representative of the majority of small states which make up the UN system, and B, uh, we have a tradition of being even-handed and somewhat detached from many, many of the key problems in the world. The new Secretary-General will be appointed at the end of the year by the UN General Assembly and the UN Security Council. Annabelle Dick, 39, Dunedin News. New legislation has come into effect aiming to improve workplace safety nationwide. The Health and Safety at Work Act introduces new penalties and requires businesses to be more proactive in eliminating work-related risks. But local union members are concerned the reforms don't go far enough in protecting the lives of employees. Making sense of new legislation. Unions Otago co-convener Fiona Matapo is wading through the almost 200 pages of the government's new Health and Safety at Work Act. The legislation has just come into effect and from a union perspective there's disappointment that it doesn't reach far enough. We're still in a situation where this legislation doesn't really cover workers and workplaces of 20 people and, and, and smaller. So that's a large group of, of workers in New Zealand for whom this legislation is going to offer no protection. It's one of the issues that Matapo and other concerned union members protested last year when the legislation was going through Parliament. While they're not entirely happy with all the changes, they're pleased that the government is making positive inroads. What we do like about the legislation is that it is starting to encourage workplaces to think about what the culture of health and safety looks like and to encourage best practice around health and safety so that workers can go to work and come home, home safely. Around 75 people die at work each year and around 10% of all workers nationwide are harmed in some way. The latest workplace incident occurred just last week when an experienced forestry foreman was killed near Napier. It's cases like that which Matapo says are still happening too frequently. We know that this isn't actually having the positive effect and positive impact that we would, would like it to. Forestry, for example, has been one area where there's been significant uh, numbers of, of deaths. And this year so far, um, there are four deaths in, in forestry and that's just not acceptable. Workplace Health and Safety Minister Michael Woodhouse concedes the Act is not a silver bullet in addressing all of the country's health and safety challenges. But he says it's a step in the right direction, helping to encourage active participation from employers and workers to reduce the workplace death and injury toll. Ruby McAndrew, 39, Dunedin News. There are concerns about local youth being exposed to dangerous levels of sun without adequate protection. A recent study is highlighting poor practice at sports days involving Dunedin secondary school pupils and staff. And that has researchers calling for change. 
pinpointing the risk of sun exposure. These academics are worried about their recent findings that sun protection is sorely lacking at local secondary sports events. That's based on 10 athletic days held in the city last summer. The sun protection practices in secondary schools are very poor. Um, so there's quite a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, and we think that needs to be done not at an individual level, but at a sort of policy, environmental, institutional level. So that we're not trying to change the behaviour of individual students, but just sort of policies within schools. Only 3% of the students wore sun protective hats while waiting to compete, and only a quarter of adult supervisors were similarly covered. Half the schools involved provided sunscreen, but the sports grounds themselves were mostly without shade. Researchers say that's something the Dunedin City Council could address. We definitely think that that's something the Council could address, and that would benefit not only students, um, current students, but students for years and years to come. These academics work in the university's Cancer Society Social and Behavioural Research Unit. They've also just studied sun protection habits within 211 secondary schools nationwide. The average institution scored points on less than half the different measures involved. There's definitely room for improvement, yes, because at a score of 11, the total that they could achieve, the, the mean score was 4.6. So they didn't get a bridge of pass mark if you want to look at it that way. But we don't really want to mark schools down and, and blame schools for things that are happening because we think they're under-resourced. A significant amount of adolescent sun exposure happens at school when ultraviolet radiation is at its peak. It's something these researchers want the wider community to acknowledge and address in the prevention of skin cancer. Rosie Mannins, 39, Dunedin News. An investigation into vandalism at the West Tyree Cemetery has produced a silver lining for affected residents. Repairs aren't going to set family members back as much as initially thought and caretakers are sharing tips for avoiding future desecration. Investigating trouble from beyond the grave. The Dunedin City Council has been looking into an attack on the West Tyree Cemetery where several headstones were desecrated. A subsequent report states the damage isn't as bad as first thought. There was an initial assessment last week but we've done some further assessments subsequently this week uh, and the investigations from that have led us to believe that the, in terms of the amount of vandalism is, is not as much um, as was originally reported. Seven headstones were damaged by vandals. Initially a dozen monuments were reported to have been affected but an investigation has found some were broken beforehand. The cost of repairs and replacement was expected to exceed tens of thousands of dollars, but the DCC estimates about $4,500 will cover damage. The majority of the damage except one headstone, um, which needs replaced, all the others um, are, have essentially been pushed over, and some of those that have been pushed over have fractured into pieces, but they are all fixable. Police and contractors are involved in an ongoing investigation into the crime. Meanwhile, the council's urging residents to pin down gravestones to help prevent such vandalism in the future. Pinning of headstones is one way to not necessarily negate vandalism, but it does make it a, a more difficult challenge or proposition for people to vandalise those headstones. So that's always one consideration that um, family members can look into if they are concerned about their own respective family headstones. As Police are urging anyone with information on the damage to report it. Annabelle Dick, 39, Dunedin News. A politician is touring universities to discuss the issues of concern for the country's youngest voters. Green Party MP Gareth Hughes visited the University of Otago recently as part of an informal initiative aimed at getting students engaged in politics. And he's hoping it'll help to counter some recent statistics. Getting some face time with a member of parliament. A handful of the city's tertiary students have been discussing all things political with Green Party MP Gareth Hughes. He's in the city as part of a nationwide tour to help engage more young people with the political system. This is our democracy, it's about debating ideas uh, and I think when you look at the stats you see so few young people participate in politics, uh, particularly voting. It's important to get out and have these conversations and my main message is we can do politics better. We can clean it up, we can fix it and we can address the real issues. A recent survey of a thousand Kiwis about their trust in certain professions has just been released by Victoria University. 
Only 8% of respondents said they trusted members of parliament. But locally, students say they're taking what Hughes has to say seriously. The students, I think, find it really interesting to hear from the politicians their perspective and their view. And they know that the politicians have fought about these issues and been working on these issues. So it's great to have them come along to share those insights with us. Since he entered Parliament in 2010, Hughes has endeavoured to undertake a speaking tour of the country's universities each year. This time around there's been discussion about the flag referendum and the possibility of a sugar tax, but for the most part it's student issues being raised. There's questions, will I have a job after I've graduated? How will I get into a house when I'm paying off a massive student loan? So these economic questions are ones that I'm finding uh, are universal across the country. It's not just a city or a regional thing, it's how do we actually have a stronger, more diversified econ economy. The upcoming local body elections were another topic of conversation with City Councillor Aaron Hawkins on hand to field questions around that. Ruby McAndrew, 39, Dunedin News. Still to come on Southern Newsweek, some big rural health issues are about to be discussed and a big win for a city hotel thanks to a multi-million dollar refit and it's expected to inspire others. Welcome back. Hundreds of delegates from around the country are gathering in Dunedin to learn more about rural health. It's the first time the yearly National Rural Health Conference has been held in the city for more than a decade. And several of the event's notable guest speakers are set to tackle some big issues. Setting up for a busy schedule, the National Rural Health Conference is kicking off with more than 500 attendees from around the country settling in Dunedin for the next few days. It's a chance for delegates to discuss the unique issues within the sector. Obviously there are things like isolation of communities, um, distance from you know, uh, specialist health services. Uh, we have issues around um, recruitment, retention and retirement. So we have an ageing GP workforce for example and um, you know, we need to be able to replace those GPs, many of whom are getting close to retirement age, with um, new doctors. The conference is in its 25th year and includes an exhibition space for businesses to provide information on a range of services. Olsen says it's about facilitating as many discussions as possible in relation to rural health. There is a, 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 an area that focuses on mental wellbeing, um, also for practitioners as well. Um, and we have, well, we have quite a rounded program really, so it does focus on medical um, or clinical, medical and nursing, but we also have community streams as well and we have management streams too. So we try and cover off as many topics as we can and uh, that's reflected in the keynote speakers. Presenters include Health Minister Jonathan Coleman as well as local woman Leslie Elliott who will speak about domestic violence. Olsen's anticipating several high profile topics will arise during those sessions, including falling dairy prices and suicide rates in farming communities. He's hoping attendees discuss ideas and concerns to strengthen the sector and support those within it. The program is dedicated to making sure that people from all rural areas um, who, who come to attend go away with some CME, which is continuing medical education, but also get to you know network with people that they probably don't see that often. Several aspects of the conference revolve around making the rural lifestyle an attractive option for graduate students working in medical fields. Organisers are expecting almost 100 students to attend and learn more about their options. Ruby McAndrew, 39, Dunedin News. The city is about to welcome a cohort of Syrian asylum seekers who would be heading into summer back home. Instead they're gearing up for their first Dunedin winter armed with few possessions. And that's got some empathetic locals making cosy contributions. Ensuring your arrivals have a warm welcome. Members of the recently established Dunedin Knits group are hard at work. They're crafting winter woolies for the first bunch of Syrian refugees arriving in Dunedin in just over two weeks. Being a knitter, I decided to make that my contribution because they're arriving in winter and it's very cold in Dunedin and the houses can be very cold too. So I didn't like to think of all the poor children and their parents and families being cold, so that's what I decided to do. Peppers put the call out on social media for others to get involved and contribute to the cause. The handmade goods are being given to Red Cross Dunedin where staff are making up packs for the new arrivals. A University of Otago lecturer is one of those getting her needles out to ensure the refugees feel welcome. When I heard that Dunedin was hosting the refugees I sort of 
posted on my Facebook page, this is fantastic, it's a great opportunity for us to show, you know, community and caring and to be like something, a beacon for New Zealand and for the whole of the world. And Lillian just took that idea and ran with it. Yeah. Wallace is also training to help the Red Cross ahead of the second cohort of refugee arrivals later this year. It's all about doing as much as she can to help out and Peppers is encouraging others to do the same. Everyone can craft whatever they want and I, I like the thought of knitting and crafting because a lot of love goes into it and that sort of follows through to whoever receives it. But if anyone wants to donate anything warm, just whatever, you know. Red Cross staff are overwhelmed by the support they've received for the refugees and the amount of goods donated so far. They're still after more kitchenware as well as small appliances and cleaning products. Ruby McAndrew, 39, Dunedin News. The multi-million dollar transformation of the city's former chief post office has been awarded a top heritage prize. The recently opened Distinction Hotel was honoured at the Dunedin Heritage Reuse Awards and organisers say the project will serve as inspiration for other developers. An award-winning building, years in the making. It's taken more than $15 million to transform the once derelict Chief Post Office, an achievement that's been celebrated at the annual Heritage Reuse Awards. But those behind the new Distinction Hotel on Princess Street say the development wasn't without its challenges. You've got to take the building for what it is for a start and then strip it back and see where you can enhance what's already there, restore and then apply the modern parts to the building basically to complement what's there. The building was on Opus Architecture's books for over 10 years before construction began in 2013. Now it's taken the top prize, award organisers say the hotel will serve as an inspiration for others keen to undertake similar renovations. What we're trying to do is celebrate the reuse of heritage buildings in the city, to really showcase uh, what the work is that's going on out there and what the possibilities are for other owners to look at and be inspired by these projects. This is the sixth year the awards have been held, recognising work in several categories including interior design as well as earthquake strengthening. Hazelton says the number of local restoration projects is ever increasing, and that's good for the city's image. Dunedin's built heritage is, is worthy of preserving, uh, mostly because it, it really gives a great definition of something different to the city. You know, it's a defining factor of why Dunedin is different than other cities around the country. He's hoping more people will want to embrace the city's heritage when building or renovating. This year's top award winner says Dunedin's perfect for that kind of overhaul. I think Dunedin's a leader easily. It's got rich history and buildings and I think that's got a great platform to keep moving forward so absolutely. Work to restore another Princess Street site was also acknowledged. The standard building was one of six properties recognised winning awards for earthquake strengthening and interior design. Ruby McAndrew, 39, Dunedin News. And just ahead on Southern Newsweek, the leader of a global spiritual movement visits town to mark the anniversary of its introduction to the Western world. And a speech on race unity is sending a local teenager to a national competition. Welcome back. A high-ranking leader within the Hare Krishna movement is visiting Dunedin. He's travelling the globe to celebrate 50 years since the spiritual practice was introduced to the Western world. And he's sharing his own unique journey from marine to monk. Cultivating spirituality. These Hare Krishnas are gathered at the movement's local centre to celebrate the presence of a world leader. The American monk is on a global tour and is thrilled to be sharing his passion with Dunedin residents. Our movement is actually very old, it's an ancient tradition, it's over 5,000 years old, but it came from India to the West in 1965. He's a former US Marine who took up arms during the Vietnam War. But it was a very difficult experience because I lost many of my friends, actually my whole football team joined the United States Marines, but I stayed back for special weapons training and all my friends shipped off to Vietnam and they all passed away within a, with actually a month or something. That prompted some soul searching and he embraced the Hare Krishna movement after studying various religions. And I gave up my violent way of life. I mean sometimes violence is required for protection but I felt more like a monk than I did a warrior. So I, I gave up my gun for my meditation beads. 
Dunedin has about 100 full-time Hare Krishnas, but a much wider part of the community is engaged with the movement. About 300 tertiary students are fed by members every day, and the centre hosts a range of activities and events open to all residents. I've added up the number of students that we've fed over the last 20 years, and I think it comes to three quarters of a million and many of them still write to me from all over the world, so I guess you could say we've got an extended family as well. She says having such a long-standing and high-profile leader visit is a true blessing. It's his third time to Dunedin and he's hoping to return, but for now China and Russia await. Rosie Mannins, 39, Dunedin News. Some of the region's top sailors have descended on Otago Harbour for a secondary school's regatta. 38 teenagers will battle the elements and each other in several races and organisers are pleased to see so many young adults taking on the challenge. Capitalising on calm conditions, dozens of young sailors have hit the water to vie for glory in the Port Otago Secondary School Sunburst Regatta. Participants from several Dunedin high schools are competing in the week-long event alongside students from as far away as Omaru. All the secondary, secondary schools from virtually Otago are invited to come along for a week at the uh, at appropriate time when they have the New Zealand Secondary Schools uh, Sports Week. And they sail Sunburst yachts and this is an eventuated from a, uh, an initiative of uh, Alan Garbutt who has since passed on but is carried on by us and managed by a lot of very keen people. On average, the crews are taking part in four or five races each day, depending on conditions. Officials are able to alter the course if the weather changes, and these guys are happy to adapt and help out their peers if necessary. This whole regatta is more, it's learning, there's good guys racing, there's beginners, and in the case of this, they help each other. And that's one of the benefits of having it, so it's a fun week. The almost 20 boats involved are an impressive sight in the middle of Otago Harbour. Waterhouse says this year's entry numbers are great in helping progress the sport while also benefiting the young participants. This is what we really want to do is you know, to keep furthering the sport, keeps them off their tablets and their phones for a couple of hours while they're out on the water in the elements. The Sunburst event runs throughout the week culminating with a prize giving on Friday evening. There's a long way to go until then though with plenty of time left for these keen sailors to show off on the water. Ruby McAndrew, 39, Dunedin News. And finally, a Dunedin teenager is heading to Auckland after winning a local speech contest. The Logan Park High School pupil will represent Otago at the national final of the Race Unity speech competition. And it's just one of several exciting things on his plate. Speaking on an important topic, Year 13 student Grant McNaughton is going over his winning delivery before participating in the National Race Unity Speech Competition. He's getting plenty of practice but says standing in front of a crowd is something that comes naturally. Public speaking is very important to me. Um, I guess it's a really good way to articulate your thoughts, to be able to verbalise them um, and to have people listen. McNaughton won the regional race unity competition late last month with a speech focusing on the idea of not being a bystander to racism and discrimination. It's a message he has personal experience with, having been in situations where he witnessed racist behaviour but was unsure what to do. I think it was a very good uh, way for me to think about that and to um, tell others how, um, how I sort of uh, feel about that situation and I think it's a, a good issue to talk about because although racism doesn't happen to everyone, everyone can have a, a role in how it plays out in society. McNaughton's been involved in speech competitions since Year 7 and is part of a regional debating team representing Otago at a competition later this year. It's just one of a handful of things on his busy agenda. He's off to London in a few months as one of two New Zealanders selected to attend an international science forum. So in July I'll be going there where people from all over the, all over the world will be um, talking about um, science, how it uh, works for their specific situation um, in their countries, and also being able to talk to some of the, the best minds in the world, really, who um, teach in places like London. As part of that trip, McNaughton will also visit Geneva, where he'll see the Large Hadron Collider. He'll be balancing all that travel and competitions with his final year of high school. Ruby McAndrew, 39, Dunedin News. And that's all for this edition of Southern Newsweek. You can find us on Facebook, YouTube and Twitter and remember to take a look at our website at dunedintv.co.nz. I'm Holly Buchanan, thanks for watching.
Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand On Air.